Uh, so anyway, the city of Cambridge is so happy to have Mass, Bike, and Galen here to talk to you about winter biking. Um, we have been working with Mass Bike for years and we're so happy to have this partnership. Um, in addition, Galen will tell you about all of the work that they do that's not just education. They do a ton of advocacy work and we're, we're very happy to have them. So I'm going to go on mute and at that, take it away, Galen. Excellent. Thanks, Jen. Um, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, we do great work with the city of Cambridge, so please check in with the CDD, um, not just for these workshops, but we're doing workshops. Um, we just finished up a series with older adults. Um, some of you may have been a part of that. Um, we've been doing, uh, when we're in person, we do learn to ride classes. We do a lot of work with the Safe Routes to Schools program with the upper schools. Um, we help lead bike rides like the Bowtie Ride and a few others in the city. So. Uh, we're super grateful that the city's got um, the passion and the resources to really make better biking for you all. Um, but there's a lot of ground to cover. So we're not going to get everything, I'm sure. But if there's a specific question, specific concern, or a story you want to share, the chat is probably the best way to throw it out there. And then we'll definitely leave time at the end for Q&A. I always like to preface all of my winter talks by saying, you only really need to ride as much as you want to. So we're going to cover a lot of ground about how to ride in the the wet and the cold and the dark. Um, but if it's not comfortable for you, if it's not like, not, not up for it, don't worry. This is no pressure of riding. It's just giving you some tips and tricks so that if you do choose to ride, you've got some base knowledge. Um, and I've been a little bit about me. I'm executive director of Mass Bike, which does statewide advocacy. So we focus on the bigger picture stuff, the policies, the legislation, the funding. But um, I've been doing bike education for probably over a decade. And I'm learning every single day. Every day that I take a bike ride, I get new tips, new tricks, new information. So I'm by no means the end of information. Um, I'm still learning. So you might have some information that you wanna share that I can take with me into my next presentations, into my next bike ride. So think of this as a two-way street. Um, and then also I wanna say that though Mass Bike does do the broader picture stuff, we partner greatly with the local impact. So we partner greatly with the city of Cambridge, um, the Cambridge Bike Safety Group, um, the Cambridge Bike Committee, which is kind of the more official side, it's working on the bike plan right now. If you're in Somerville, there's a Somerville Bike Committee. Um, I live in Alston. We have a group uh, the, called Common Wheels. We also partner with the Boston Cyclist Union. So um, for those of you who are familiar with Massachusetts politics, um, all politics is local. I also like to think that all biking is local. So I'm gonna to try to make this as pertinent to your riding as much as possible. Um, but I'm curious to know what you're experiencing out there. So at the end, I'll share my contact information and we could always stay in touch. Um, I'm interested to know how your riding is going so that I can um, work and advocate for better riding for you. So that said, today we're gonna to talk about winter biking basics and focus on the basics, but we are gonna cover some, you know, if you wanna be harder core, what it would take. But uh, again, just to say by no means do I want to say that you have to ride in the ice and snow, but for those of you who choose to, um, there are options out there to make it possible. So with that, we'll jump right on in. Um, I always like to say why ride in the winter. So there is a lot of reasons, I like to say for fun, for fitness, for getting around. Um, for those of you who are used to the city's traffic, um, it is tough to drive in the city. It's even tougher to park in the city, especially in snowy conditions. Um, and of course, we want to cut down on our carbon footprint. We want to be as sustainable as possible. We want to be as healthy as possible. Um, I'm a big fan of active transportation because I can get my exercise in my bike ride, in my bike commute. So for all these reasons, and then um, as Ron mentioned, um, Ron here is leading a, an illuminations ride later this week. So the fun, we're putting the fun back in biking. It's always fun to go ride with a group, go explore new areas, and especially this time of year to check out the awesome Christmas lights or holiday lights, Festivus, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, whatever, if you just wanna brighten up. Um, today is the winter solstice. Just a heads up, it is the darkest, shortest that it will get. So uh, we wanna celebrate that by maybe hopping on a bike and going and checking out some of the lights for fun. So another pitch for you, Ron, for thank you for leading another group bike ride. Um, and that is just a, one of the, the many reasons why we do like to ride. And then of course, the biggest things are we need to cut down on our climate change, um, greenhouse gas emissions. The transportation sector is in Massachusetts responsible for about 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's a lot. And so what can we do to really start to tackle that? 
for the existential problems we're facing. Like, let's, let's really think about moving sustainably, moving healthily, that's good for the whole community. So with that, let's jump into how to ride. So you don't need to go full out, but I'll focus on the slide for just a second. So a couple things that might be interested um, about this one image are we focus on the bike and we focus on the body. So I want you to kind of split what we're gonna talk about today into two tracks. How can you modify your ride? How can you think about your bike? Is it the right bike to be riding in the winter? Um, and that's kind of hard to, a lot of people, they say they have a bike and that's their bike. Um, for those of you who do ride in all weather um, or ride in all conditions or ride in all terrains, you know, again, I'm a bike advocate. It's kind of my career, but I treat my bikes like I treat my footwear. So I have galoshes for the rain. I have a rain bike. Maybe it's a blue bike because that bike can get all wet and muddy and somebody else can take care of it. Um, and for running shoes, for those of you who are joggers, you might have a road bike so that you can go for longer distances for a little faster, um, a little sleeker. Um, and the same can be said about snowy conditions. So you've got your snow boots. So you can think about maybe modifying your bike or having a specific bike that's used in all weather, specifically in snow. Um, a couple of things we'll talk about a little bit later of how to modify your bike, but how on this bike, this modification is fatter tires, which means that they have better grip they can ride more on top of the snow. So you'll see that these are really balloon style tires. Um, the braking mechanism is actually disc brakes. So it is a kind of a stronger stopping power and it doesn't necessarily get all gunked up for uh, if you're riding in slush and snow. Uh, if you have rim style brakes, which are very common and I have rim brakes on my winter bike, it's fine. Um, but you, know, you can think about how the braking mechanism works. Um, you can think about the gearing now this bike here has a full set of gears. I can tell by the derailleur that I can see, which changes the gear mechanisms and um, changes the chain. Some people modify their bike to make it a single speed, to make it a little bit more simpler, to take away some of the mechanics in the back, to make it easier to clean and easier to maintain. Um, and you'll see that this bike, it's kind of like a mountain bike style, but the rider is more upright. So for those of you who might be familiar with road bikes where you're more angled down, um, you know, for the winter, you might want to actually get a bike that has you a little bit more upright, um, which means it's a little bit less efficient to ride, but it might be easier to maneuver, it might be easier to turn, just some considerations to put out there. Um, you'll also see on the body, on this biker, um, we'll start with the appendages. So you'll see that he's got full mittens, um, maybe even bar mitts. So they're mittens that cover the whole hand, as long as he can still shift and break, and I'm assuming it's a he, but I shouldn't assume, but we'll just say the rider. Um, you can say that they've got um, mittens on to make sure that their fingers stay warm and the appendages, at least for most of us, are the things that get cold first. Um, you'll see that they're in snow boots. So boots that are specific for walking in the snow and you'll see that the pedals are modified to make them a little wider platform so they can get good grip and good control. Um, this rider is in snow pants. I'm gonna assume that they are kind of insulated, but they're probably waterproof above all else. They have kind of a lightweightish jacket, but it's a pretty visible jacket. So one thing I want you to pay attention to is the brightness. It's a bright blue. So if they're riding out there, they're gonna stand out. Um, I recommend being visible. Um, and then you'll see for the helmet, there's a cover for the helmet so that the holes that helmets may have for ventilation get covered up to keep their head a little bit warmer. Um, and you'll see that he's got a mask on, which good for COVID, but also good for winter. Um, and then probably some earmuffs and maybe even a cap underneath it or a buff. So again, this is just one example, but I want you to think about what we talk about today in terms of what's good for the bike and what's good for the body. Um, and I'm gonna point out a couple things. I know I can see Ron, at least he's on my screen. So Ron's grabbing a reflective vest to put on. That's a great example of what you should wear. It's my recommendation to be as bright and visible as possible out on the roads for motorists, for pedestrians and for other bikers to see you. Um, but while I'm talking, if you wanna think about winter gear that you would take out there, um, whether you're biking or walking or, or whatever else might fit for your style, please feel free to grab some winter and we can talk about it uh, when we take our break um, towards the end of the presentation. But again, think about the bike, think about the body. So winter commuting, especially in Cambridge, does come in all forms. And a lot of that depends on where you want to be riding. For those of you who are okay riding in traffic, and if you're comfortable riding in the streets, 
typically the roads are pretty well plowed. Um, sidewalks are dependent on the landowner. Um, if it's a business or if it's a private residence, that is up to the owner to make sure that the sidewalks are cleared, which is a little bit less of a guarantee. So that's something to keep in mind that if you are gonna be riding, you might wanna feel comfortable. Um, if you're gonna go all out in the snowy conditions, like we have a foot of snow out now, the roads are the most clear. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, the pathway systems, which Cambridge does have quite a bit at, um, they're generally very well plowed if they're Cambridge owned, but if they're a state pathway, like the ones along the river, or if it's where the pathway systems kind of interchange in terms of jurisdictions, you might need to be ready to ride either on the snow, which is possible, or you know you might have to kind of walk your bike through some of the more tricky areas, which is also fine. Walking your bike for a couple blocks is not the end of the world. Um, you can think about riding if you're riding um, in the weather. So on the bottom right, that person is actually trudging through a wintry condition, which to be honest, sometimes I'm waiting for the snow to be over before I hop out and ride. Um, and then, you know, you can think about being multimodal, like the top left, that a gentleman in the mustache and the white coat is riding a blue bike. So chances are that they're doing the T. So they're riding, I think that's the Central Square garage, um, portal there. So they're probably taking the red line to their uh, close to their destination. And then they're going to take a bike share bike to get all the way there. Um, you can think about cargo bikes, you can think about tall bikes. Um, there's, the goal is whatever type of riding that you want to do, chances are with a little bit of modification, you can still do it in the winter time up to a certain extent, up to your comfort level and up to where you wanna ride. And what we're gonna cover today is um, hopefully what's gonna overlap with the type of riding that you wanna do, because again, we're here to express and encourage you to go out and ride not to say you want to go all out, like to be honest, I probably wouldn't ride in the conditions that the person in the bottom right is riding in. But again, um, the idea is to make it possible so that they can choose to ride if they do so want to. Cool. The biggest things we get, the biggest questions that we get are what are the good uh, layers and the good clothing to make it through the winter time? So my uh, adage that I like to keep in the back of my mind is an old one from New England. And full disclosure, I'm actually from Virginia, born and bred, but I moved to Boston in 2002. So I'm about 18 winters in at this point, and I've learned some tips. Um, my biggest tip is to remember that there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. So what can you do to get around some of the nastiness? Um, I also like to think of the barriers to riding in the winter are the cold, the dark and the wet. So those three, the cold, dark and wet can really be combated with clothing. So this checklist here is kind of my go-to depending on the weather scenarios which I'm gonna ride. And again, if it's 30 degrees, I'm gonna be wearing different layers than it's gonna be if it's three degrees. But you should know, for those of you who have lasted a New England winter, that with proper layering, you can actually get through some of the cold, some of the dark and some of the wet, as long as you're doing it with enough planning, with preparation and with enough layers. So always, 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 my number one rule is to start with a base layer, which ideally is not cotton. For those of you who are hikers, for those of you who go out on the whites or take the weekend out, it's the same type of gear that you would if you were hiking or camping, um, cross-country skiing, snowshoeing. If you are out in cotton, cotton absorbs the moisture, but it doesn't actually wick it and let it evaporate. So one of the biggest challenges that's out there is that you will heat up. You will burn calories and you will warm up. So think about having a base layer that actually takes that moisture and takes that heat and pulls it away from your body so that it can actually evaporate out. So the bottom layer typically is a thin wicking base layer. Could be nylon, um, it could be spandex if you wanna go that far, uh, could be merino wool, could be wool, depending on the cost. Um, if you go expensive, merino wool is probably the most expensive. It's very fine knit wool. You don't need to go that far if you don't want to, you don't wanna have the expense. Whatever's within your budget, just try to avoid cotton the best as possible or have a, something with a cotton spandex nylon mix. Um, base layers could be a t-shirt, could be a thin set of um, long johns or long underwear, 
could be a thin um, base layer glove, um, could be a buff like I'm wearing here. This actually operates as a really good base layer. So if I'm gonna layer um, a hat or a helmet on top of it, this I'll show you here. My base layer is actually really good, keeps my ears warm. It's a totally synthetic, stretchy material. This is a really wonderful um, piece of equipment called a buff, which is also very versatile. Once you've got your base layer, you're gonna to wanna to think about a medium weight layer, something that keeps you a little warmer. Not something that is fully, fully warm, but something that at least traps a little of that uh, heat that's being pulled away from the wicking, but doesn't necessarily may leave you without kind of just that secondary layer to keep you a little bit warm. Um, again, I like to recommend wool um, or some sort of like wool blend. Um, I'm a wool kind of guy because even if it gets wet on the outer, it doesn't stay wet and actually dries pretty quickly. Um, could be a sweater, um, could be wool pants. Um, I don't necessarily recommend denim. Um, denim is fully cotton and actually very heavy. So if it gets wet, it will absorb a lot of that water. And that's something to avoid. But think about something that is uh, uh, after the liner, liner top and a liner bottom, liner gloves and liner socks. Think about something that could be a slightly warmer insulating layer. And then depending on the temperature, I might even go one more layer. I might go a full on heavier sock, heavier glove. And I've got a few gloves to show you in a second that I'll pull out in a moment. Um, but that would be if you really want to go out in the single digits or the teens. If you've got three layers on and you're moving, chances are you'll probably make it OK. Um, it's really easy to overheat when you're riding. So one of the biggest tips I like to say is plan for where you're going to be about 10 or 15 minutes into your trip. If your trip is going to be a 20 or 30 minute bike ride or a walk and a ride, or you're going to be on the T and you're going to be inside and in heated areas, um, and you're wearing a lot of layers, you will actually start to overheat, which is kind of almost more dangerous than being cold. When your body starts to overheat, you don't really have that awareness. You don't really have that connection between the head and the body. Um, you don't have as good a reaction time because it's just a physiological phenomenon. When you are overheating, um, your body is kind of not really happy. So you're gonna to wanna to find a time that if you are warming up into your ride, you should have the ability to almost disrobe or take a layer off, which seems counterintuitive. But one of the biggest tips that I learned in my 18 winters is that I'll find a spot on my ride. If I have like a five mile ride and it's a 30 minute bike ride, for instance, about halfway through, I might stop and take off a layer, um, which means you might wanna have a cargo or a bag or a basket to put it in. But if you start to overheat, you really need to just find a way to cool down. Now, sometimes it could be a zipper. You just unzip a little bit. Um, some biking gear has zippers in the armpits um, or zippers on the sides. You can have ventilation on your pants if you have good um, hiking or skiing pants. Typically, there's ventilation built into that too, because again, you want to get that moisture and that airflow away from the body. But you should plan to overheat. And if that's the case, you're going to need to disrobe and take off layers, which again is not really that intuitive. And then the last layer. Um, which is super important in conditions like that's out there now um, where it's wet, even if it's not like literally snowing or sleeting or raining on you, um, there will be a lot of moisture that's kicked up, a lot of slush, a lot of snow. Um, and typically we don't get this type of snow that we're seeing right now until January, February or March, but it's happening early this year. So be ready. Um, but you're going to want a uh, waterproof layer and a waterproof layer like a rain jacket, a very light shell just to go over your sweater or over your down jacket or over your coat is really key to making sure that if it is wet, then it won't actually get down and make your base layers wet. So having a rain jacket um, is usually what I do. So I have my same rain gear that I'll have in the summertime. I'll use in the winter, it's just the layers underneath it will change depending on what season I'm at. Um, so again, raincoats and the outer layer, um, make it as bright as possible, make it as reflective as possible. It doesn't do anybody any good if you're wearing a neon jacket, but then you cover it with a black uh, rain shell. So think about whatever the outermost layer is as being as reflective and visible as possible. Um, and then for accessories, um, if you're really gonna go out, um, you can, for those of you who are skiers, 
Um, goggles kind of can be a must, especially if you're gonna be out for a while. Um, mitts, gloves, um, sunglasses are actually really key if you're gonna be out on a bright blue sky day, but there's lots of glare from the snow and ice. Sunglasses are also key as well. And they also protect your eyes if you're ever riding um, and it is starting to snow or ever ice coming down from the sky. They do a good job of protecting it. So a few things that I brought here to show you. Um, and Galen, as you're, as you're showing folks, mm -hmm. there are a couple of questions in the chat about mm -hmm. what do you do when you have got eyeglasses and a mask and how do you make sure you can still see and they don't fog up? Ooh, great question. Um, I wear contacts. So sometimes that's my solution is just to wear contacts. But I know that's not for everybody. So sometimes I'm adding glasses too. Um, when my goggles here, which are kind of nice, they actually have vents towards the bottom. Um, these are really low grade ski goggles. Um, I probably paid maybe $15 for them. So, you know, they're, they're not too top of the line. They're not Oakley's per se. They don't do any polarization or any sun glare. So I might have my sunglasses under them. And then just making sure that the um, band is wide enough so that they can go over my glasses. Um, there's been a lot of studies about when you're wearing the buffs these days or face masks and then glasses because, oh, I saw a great sign. It says, um, uh, do you wear a mask and glasses? You are entitled to condensation. Um, but the idea is that there's ways around uh, getting, um, getting around having that condensation make their way up. One of the sneaky ways that I saw was getting a nose bandage, like the kind that you get if you've ever gotten like a cut on your nose. Um, and actually, if you're wearing a mask or a buff, typically the masks, especially the N95 mask, you put the bandage like right about here and it deflects the airflow to go around the cheekbones and doesn't necessarily go up into the glasses. And when I'm out in my glasses, when I choose to ride in glasses, I've actually done that trick and it has worked. So uh, a little nose bandage, which I know is like, it's kind of a waste of a bandage sometimes, but it it, it gets you to work. It gets you to the grocery like store. like a Band-Aid? Yeah, just like a Band-Aid. Uh -huh. And that's, that's like a way to kind of deflect some of the condensation away. Key is finding ventilation. So finding goggles that have vents in them or finding a gap between where you're wearing them. So they're not so uh, snug against the face. So there is a way for the airflow to come in the back. Yeah. Um, one consideration to have though, is that when you are wearing goggles or um, anything else, just if it changes your peripheral vision, um, it might limit how far you can see from the sides if you are gonna be riding in traffic. So um, I should preface by, every, by all the tips I'm saying is that get familiar with your gear, um, practice. Um, practice in a parking lot without traffic, practice um, anything new to change up your ride, get used to it before you fully commit and hop out on the streets. Um, and then feel free to change it up because things are will, will be modified based off your particular needs. So some of these tips are things that I've learned or Ron's learned or some of the, the folks here have learned. So um, we're always learning. Um, I'll talk a minute for about gloves. So the gloves that we have showed here on the image are what are known as the lobster mitts. So these are really nifty. They're basically like three fingered gloves. Um, and these are really great because what they do is they create kind of a buddy system, almost like a, you know, a Spock, um, you know, the, uh, the Leonard Nimoy fingers together, the um, totally blanking on the, um, the phrase. Um, oh, it's killing me, but um, you get it. Um, but the idea of having your fingers next to each other, they actually keep each other warm. Um, you know, my partner has Raynaud syndrome, which means the capillaries at the tips of her fingers get um, really cold fast because the just the, don't get the same blood flow. So she um, kind of lives off of the mittens um, as opposed to having a five finger glove. Um, and a five finger glove is great if you've got a liner glove or if it's not that cold, but the trouble is if you don't get blood flow to the tips of your fingers, a five finger glove is not gonna keep your hands warm because uh, it just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work. The blood doesn't get there. And that's kind of where your heat is produced from. So the buddy system with a lobster mitt um, is really what I would recommend as well. Um, as long as you can still, because you're thinking about how you're biking, as long as you can still grab the handlebars, um, depending on the type of shifter that you have, as long as you can still shift, as long as you can still brake. Uh, the cool thing about uh, these lobster mitts is they're made for biking. So you'll see a couple things. There's a pad right here, which has some grip to it. It's like a little faux leather pad and a little grip right here. Um, 
It's reflective. So you'll see, even though it's black, there's retro reflectivity in it. So if I'm riding in the streets, it kind of pops a lot more, which is also nice. Biking gear typically has reflectivity built into it. Um, and then if it's really cold, I have it over there. I'm not going to get them, but it's basically like I get a liner glove, like a really small liner glove, and I can fit it underneath my lobster mitt or underneath my five finger glove as an extra insulating layer. Again, trying to make that moisture wicking as best as possible. Um, same considerations that if you're out on a cold day in a walk, out in a cold day when you're skiing or hiking, um, same gear, same principles, same work. But when you're riding a bike, you have to make sure that you can still shift, that you can still brake, and that you can still steer, and you're not limited to that with whatever gloves that you have. Because keep in mind that everything on your handlebars is super crucial to have working. And Galen, where can you purchase those? I got these from a bike shop. Um, so typically from a bike shop, they're a little pricey, I would say about 50 or $60 for a set of gloves. Um, so if that's out of the price range, that's also fine. Um, when I was in my more unemployed days as an undergraduate, um, what I would do is actually get um, kind of just regular like neoprene gloves, almost like surgical gloves, which were not moisture wicking. So though they kept my hands warm, they made my hands clammy. So it wasn't the best, but it worked on a really cold day. Um, I could actually like wear a neoprene glove. Um, to, it also did the job of keeping my hand uh, dry so even if it was snowing or raining, I could wear a thin, thin glove that's plastic or neoprene or, or nylon or, play, or um, uh, Playtex or, and then just put it under the glove. If my glove were to get sopping wet because of the snow, my hand would stay warm and dry, though it was clammy. What is the advantage of the three finger uh, lobster glove over a conventional mitten? Um, some of it might be the control that you have around the bike. So this is made so that I can um, like sometimes the shifters that I have on some of my bikes, I have to kind of like move and like click with my fingers if I'm shifting or downshifting on a mitten that makes it more difficult. And um, I can also, if you're a mountain biker, you're familiar with, you really only need to have one finger or two fingers over your brake lever. So you can keep your hands on the rest of the handlebar for control. So you really don't need a lot of leverage on your brakes. So this allows me to keep the bottom two fingers or the, the left or the outermost two fingers on my handlebars and still be able to control my brakes while having a full grip on my handlebars. Um, but besides that, mittens are also fine. So if I go back to this photo of this gentleman, he's in mittens and probably in bar mitts. So if, if it works for your bike, it's fine, just the same. It's just considerations to keep in mind when you're making your choices. And another comment in the chat is, um, I found that the more specific bike bike specific gloves wear down a lot slower while I've shredded mittens biking commuting bike commuting before. Great, great point. Yeah, the $60 I invested in this five years ago are still around. I mean, these mittens are still around because there you can see there's extra padding where I'm holding the grip. Um, and it's if you have the means to do it, I do recommend, especially with your outerwear, your your rain gear. Um, going that extra dollar amount, if you can. Um, I do like to say that if your rain gear is only 90% waterproof, you're going to get 100% wet. Uh, it's, it's, but again, you know, I, I remember when I was an undergrad and didn't have any income, I did whatever I could. So I got around it sometimes where um, when I'm caught in a rainstorm, can't take the tea or caught in a snowstorm, um, I've actually popped into a CVS um, gotten some plastic bags, which I know you can't get plastic bags at CVSs anymore, but you used to be able to. Um, and I would put plastic bags over my hands to keep them warm. Or even if my socks were getting wet, I would put plastic bags um, over my feet and then put that into my boot. So my boot would get wet, but my foot would stay dry. So there are workarounds for the budget conscious. Um, and if it's, you know, if it gets me where I'm going and then I can dry off when I get there, it's not the end of the world. I'm still able to bike and get to my destination. Um, there are workarounds. And then Galen, can you just explain what the difference between water resistant and waterproof is? Yeah, great question. A lot of it is like, if you're gonna be out in the snow, like today where it's dry outside, but yet the snow's out there, water resistant will be totally fine. But if you're ever choosing to go out while it's sleeting, like last night, for instance, it was kind of a mix of wintry mix. Um, if it's not waterproof, 
it's going to get wet. So water resistant is good for short trips, um, for something that only gets, you know, a little bit of water on it, a little bit of splashback, you can probably be totally fine. Um, my boots, for instance, mostly are water resistant. Um, my hiking boots are, but if it's really snowing or raining, I'll put on my rubber galoshes because I know that they're waterproof. So um, my waterproof galoshes, I got them from Agway for super cheap. They were like $15 rubber boots, um, really low grade, but they do the job of keeping my feet dry when I need them. But typically I'll try to go in my winter boot, which is arguably a hiking boot, which is if I'm out in the snow too long, they will get wet um, over time just from you know absorption. So that's, that's kind of the big difference there. Um, and now that we've got the wonders of the internet, I would say do compare and contrast. If you are gonna go buy some gear, do some research and you'll be, you'll be happy um, to know that there's a contrast between the different items which you can find out there. Um, if you wanna go the extra mile too, you can get fully waterproof gloves. So these are lightweight, um, but they are pretty much rubber gloves made for biking. And you'll see that they are bright green. So they're very visible. They've got grips on them. Um, these are from a company called Showers Pass, which is a company out of, I think they're out of uh, Seattle. Maybe they're out of Portland. Anyway, they're somewhere from the, the very wet Northwest. So you can trust a company that if it's good enough for the Northwest and the rainstorms out there. Um, and then uh, you'll see some, some of the lighter weight gloves too. Again, depending on the weather, if it's only you know 35 or 40 degrees, I might go in a glove like this. Very bright, um, padded, still really reflective, but um, you know, I don't need the full mitten all of the time. Because again, it's easy to overheat. Um, what other gear might I have to show? Um, I used to work at a bike shop, so I was able to purchase waterproof socks, which again are like waterproof gloves. These do the, the due diligence of keeping my feet totally dry, but it took me like 10 years to convince myself that I should buy these. But if you do think about it, there are options of getting straight up waterproof socks and waterproof gloves. And again, going that extra mile. Um, and then lastly, um, the helmet is a, is a big concern. So whatever layering you're doing, um, I also ride typically in like a, you know, like a little scully cap that's wool and kind of nice. But if it's um, too much for my helmet, I might need to change how my helmet straps work. And if it's, I can't fit my helmet around it, um, you're going to maybe think about uh, just changing out how the helmet fits so that you can get around all of that gear too. It's absolutely crucial that your helmet covers your forehead and the straps go around and buckle with comfort. Um, and if you're going to have too many layers of hats, you, you know, you've got to find a way to make sure that your helmet still fits. So one way to do it is like Ron is showing here is to make sure that it does go around the cap. But what I've also found are these buffs um, are really key because they're super thin. So even though my helmet couldn't fit around my big hat, it could easily fit around my buff and I can slide it in like that as long as I'm covering my ears. Um, and then some people go so far as to tape up the holes. You can get a helmet cover if you wanna go for that far, but typically just getting some tape and just taping up the ventilation keeps your head that much warmer. Just to recap, layers are key. Um, make sure that your layers do the due diligence of allowing you to wick and get the moisture out. Um, know that you will overheat if you over layer. So plan to take off layers or have ventilation built into the layers. Um, and you can also modify how you ride. So if you start to feel like you're overheating, just slow down, just ride a little easier. You can also uh, regulate how many calories you're burning by how hard you're riding. Um, and then the last tip again, just to remind you, retro uh, reflectivity is gonna be absolutely crucial, especially out there oh, when it's super dark. Tonight is the darkest night of the year. Um, and make sure that you're visible and you can pop if you're gonna be riding in the streets. Cool. Um, and those are just a few tips. There's tons and tons more, so we can always stay in touch. Cool. So talked about the body. Uh, let's talk about the bike. So again, this bike here might be a little extreme, but I'll point out a few things about this bike. So the bike itself have, has uh, bar mitts. We'll talk about those. Those are actually gloves that are built into the bike. It's an accessory that you can put over the handlebars so that you don't necessarily need uh, to have full gloves on. 
Um, they do the job of blocking the wind and keeping your hands insulated and warm, and you can still shift and brake and, and all the rest and steer without needing to worry about the gloves. Um, the bike has a fender. So the fenders are also key. That's kind of the, um, on the back to a wheel and the front wheel to make sure that any splash of slush, salt and sand doesn't get kicked up onto you. So having some fenders are key. You can get plastic fenders that just get attached to it. Um, you could get fenders that screw in if you have bolts and eyelets for your bike and actually get like real bike manufactured fenders and put it on there. Um, and again, back in my undergraduate days, I would take um, like a pizza box or um, like a soda box and just cover it in duct tape and kind of tape it over to, again, the goal is to keep that slush from getting kicked up on you, um, whatever it takes, but that's gonna make or break your ride and keep from what's getting the skunk trail, we call it, where if you ride and show up somewhere and you've got this like trail of mud up on your back, um, yeah, you, you could use some fenders. Um, so fully consider modifying your bike, as long as it doesn't impede your braking or your steering or the wheel being able to spin. Um, and bike shops can help you there too. And you've got a ton of bike shops in Cambridge who are more than happy to step you through what works or doesn't work for your bike. Um, you'll notice that on this bike, the gearing has been changed. There's only a one gear. This is called a single speed. So though the bike might be able to be made for multiple gears, the person who had this bike uh, changed it. So they took off the gearing in the rear, um, shortened the chain length, and made it so that you can only stay in one gear, which is probably fine if you're riding around Cambridge. It's flat, you're not going that far. Um, but the goal of winter riding too is maintenance and making sure that your bike doesn't get all destroyed from the salt and sand. It's way easier to maintain gears and chains if you don't have a derailleur system, if you don't have multiple gears that can clog up with salt and sand. So keep that in mind is that you have the ability to modify the gearing to make it more winter appropriate. Um, the pedals on this bike, a little hard to see because they blend in a little bit, but they're flat pedals. And by that, I mean that they're like wide um, and they're made for uh, you know, wide boots. Um, for those of you who you know, might be riding now, take a look at your pedals. That's gonna be absolutely key. Um, there's three contact points on a bike. There's the hands, there's the bum, and there's the feet. You gotta make sure that the feet are in control and that they don't slip off the pedals and that's easy to access the pedals. So having wide flat pedals is great. Um, pedals are not that expensive. If you wanna switch them out, maybe $20 or so in a bike shop will probably help you out to getting some low grade plastic pedals. Um, if you do go that route, don't be afraid for asking for help from a bike shop of how to take pedals on and off. They can be a little tricky just because one side is a reverse threading I don't want to go into it too much, but if you try to take off the pedals yourself, a lot of uh, people I've talked to have stripped out their uh, crank arm by putting the pedal in wrong. It's just a small thing to keep in mind that bike shops are there to help you out. Um, but getting some wide pedals will really help, especially if you're going to be riding in snow boots or galoshes like I do. Um, you can ride clipped in for those of you who ride with like the little snap in clips. Um, that's fine too. You can get special boots that do that or you can normally wear your uh, bike shoes, but you might want to get covers for them because typically they're going to get uh, wet. Um, and because bike shoes are made for ventilation, your feet are going to get cold quicker. So think about some covers, which is also something that you could do. Um, and then uh, I don't necessarily recommend those of you who ride with the cages. So cages are the things that kind of loop over the pedal that lock your foot in, they kind of go over the foot. I don't recommend that in the snow because you're going to want to be able to get your foot on and off the pedal more easily. Um, you might slip a little bit. You might not go down, but you might slide around a little bit on the snow if you do choose to ride in the snow and ice. Again, you don't have to, but um, you wanna make sure that your foot isn't necessarily locked into a place so that you can easily get the foot on and off the pedals. Um, and then lastly, with this bike here, um, wider tires. Um, fatter the tire, the easier it's gonna be to ride over the snow, um, and we all know that as well as they plow the snow on the streets and the bike path, there will be, you know, a, somebody who shoveled out their car and dumped the snow in the sidewalk or in the bike lane, um, or the snow plow that pushed that little bit of snow that dumped over, and you might need to ride over the snow. If you don't want to ride in the snow, that's fine. Like, you can be a three and a half season rider. That's totally cool. And 
this snow will probably be gone at the Christmas rain. Unfortunately, we'll probably be back to, uh, you know, standard wet without the, the snow and ice. But if you do ride in the snow and ice, you're gonna to wanna to have wider tires, knobby tires, something that um, like mountain biking would be good for. And you can also go with studded tires, which again, it's another investment, but you can swap out your tires like a lot of drivers do in their cars. They have winter tires for their cars, actually have little metal studs built into the rubber. Um, if you do have rubber tires with studs, you can ride pretty much on the ice um, slowly. I'd say don't go crazy, but it does give you grip. And it's kind of wonderful. Um, it took me years to be convinced to have studded tires, but once I did, it allowed me to ride over some of those black ice patches, which is where I'm the most concerned about riding because that's when you can slip the, the most. So if you do go that route, I'd say studded tires are probably about 40 to $60 per tire. So it is an investment, um, but you, know, you can put them on in December and take them off in March and they can last multiple, multiple seasons. So it's not something you always have to have on. Um, and tires, just like chains and brake pads and other parts of the bike, they are consumable parts of the bike. So they do wear out and they do need to be replaced. Um, but it's just another thing to think about. Um, and the yeah, last my... thing I'll mention about this bike, and then I'll let you jump in, Jen, um, make sure that you have lights. Lights are absolutely key as a must, especially important in the winter, even in the daytime, um, have multiple sets of lights and lights for being seen. So like blinky is like this so that the car drivers see you. But then also if you're gonna be riding out when it's dark, have lights like a secondary set of lights that allow you to see almost like if you were, um, you know, at, need a headlight to get out there. So have multiple lights. Um, I know that Cambridge Community Development Department has similar lights like these. We hand them out all the time to riders who are riding without lights at night. These are again, more for being seen by drivers, which is absolutely a must. Um, a white light in the front and a red light in the back, just like any vehicle out on the roads. But if you are riding without lights at night, you are riding illegally. So you should know that you are breaking the law. But besides that, I'm not concerned. You're probably not gonna get a ticket. That's not the point. Point is to be safe and avoid the crashes the best you can so that you are visible, so that you don't get in a situation where a driver does not see you out there. Cool. All right, so you've got a whole bunch of questions. What is it like to ride with stuttered, studded tires on when it's snowy, icy? Great question. Um, when it's not snowy and icy, it slows you down because it removes uh, that little bit of friction. Um, and it it's a little hard to, to, to dive into too much without going into too many other slides. But the idea of if you're riding on pavement and it's not icy out, you only need a little bit of rubber in order to make that traction work. And the narrower the tire, the less friction there is. So you can actually go faster on a narrower tire more efficiently. On studded tires, typically they're wider and because they're studs, they actually kind of pull the rubber a little bit off the ground. So you are a little, um, I'd say skittier, um, not to the point where I think you'll slide out, but you don't have as good grip. So the, the metal stud causes the tire to slip just a little bit more, which means it's a less efficient ride if you're trying to ride on pavement. Um, if you're riding- It's going to bumpity bumpity bump. Yeah, it, it's, it's more smooth because there's studs pretty much almost at every tread, but it sounds like you're riding on metal a little bit. It's like kind of got this whir to it because it's like a little bit of rubber, I mean, a little bit of metal. Um, if you're riding them on pure pavement regularly, what you're going to end up doing is wearing down the studs prematurely. So if it's not regularly snowy and icy, I would say don't do studded tires until we know we're going to get snow for a while, or that you're definitely going to ride in the snow and ice and there's like, you're going to ride in it. So let's just go ahead and put them on. Um, but if you ride on pavement, they wear down the metal and it, it kind of makes the stud a little bit less effective when you need it the most. Great. Um, and then the, the last question so far on this slide is when and why should we reduce our tire inflation? Ooh, that was my next point too. Um, your tires will be inflated to a certain range and the range will be written on the side wall of every tire. It'll say uh, in PSI, which stands for pounds per square inch, a lower range and a higher range typically. Sometimes there's just a higher range, but you know you could go about 10 or so PSI below and be okay. 
The reason there's a range is because if you go below that range, you run the risk of having too much squish in the tire, which can cause a pinch flat. And that's something that is to avoid because that'll pinch your inner tube and then you get a flat tire. If you go above that PSI range, you run the risk of the tire having too much pressure and slipping off of the wheel, the rim of the wheel, then you get a blowout. So the idea of being within the, the range that the tire is written, literally every tire has it etched into the side of the tire. You should go look at your bike and see what it says. Um, I, in the wintertime, go on the lower end. And the lower end means that it's a squishier ride, which means the tire squishes down a little bit more, which gives it a little bit more traction. Um, the traction allows you to, um, you'll basically have a little bit more grip. Um, I'll, I'll keep this on actually. I'll put my hat on just for winter purposes. My hair's a mess. Um, if you have a squishier tire, you'll have a little bit more grip because there's more tire contact. There's more surface uh, that it's gripping onto. However, it is a less efficient ride because there's more friction that comes with that. Um, the more tire hitting the contact, the more friction that causes and it slows you down a little bit. It makes it a softer ride, but it makes it a slower ride. But in the snow, I would recommend, just like if you're riding in the dirt, the more you're gripping into, the more snow you're grabbing with the tire, the better traction you have. So even though it slows you down just a little bit, you might notice it um, to be 10 PSI lower than you would if you were riding on just pavement, it is um, better control and it'll allow you better grip. So I would recommend riding at the lower end of your PSI in the winter time. And it also allows you the ability to roll over the rock salts a little bit better. Um, the salt trucks, um, Cambridge is a little bit better because they, they use brine solution. So it's more of a liquid um, for the most part. But um, a lot of municipalities and Cambridge too a little bit, um, they'll throw giant like, you know, almost like nickel sized pieces of salt um, out there and uh, you'll run over those and you'll feel like riding over a rock. So if you have a squishier tire, it allows you to roll over those a little bit smoother. Whereas if you had a higher pressure, you would feel that a little bit more on your bump. So it's, it's a subtle difference, but that's where my personal preference is. I might recommend if you're unsure, give it a try riding at the higher end of your PSI, see if you have better grip or less grip, see if it's a more comfortable or less comfortable ride, and then do that at the lower end. My guess is better traction in the snow at the lower end, a more comfortable ride, but a slower ride. Cool, great. Um, we talked a little bit about this uh, and I can't belabor the point enough, you have to be seen out there. So high-vis clothing, high-vis lights, be as bright as possible. Retro reflectivity is key. Yes, thank you, Ron, you've got a reflective band. Um, Oh, I forgot to mention, you can get little like leg bands. This is my leg band too, that has a reflective gear in it. All the little things, um, you can get reflective tape for your bike. Um, you can put reflective tape on your helmet. Um, this was a black helmet, but now I spray painted it silver. So I'm much more visible out there. Whatever you can do to make yourself seen will make you safer. And that's absolutely crucial. Today is the winter solstice. It is really dark outside. Um, sun goes down at 4 p.m. Like you're going to be riding um, in the dark, be ready for it. Uh, we have some studies out. Um, the most visible colors are neon green and neon yellow. Um, and it's from a distance, it's the farthest that's visible uh, to the human eye. Um, and it's what drivers are tuned into seeing because construction workers, um, police officers, and other uh, road users who have safety equipment are typically in like neon green, um, neon yellow or neon orange. Um, blue, there've been a lot of studies, blue is a less uh, length of a visibility. Um, and then white is a little bit trickier as well because white, especially in snow can blend in at least a white light in front and a red light in back. And then I've seen other uh, like disco lights or neon lights, if you've been part of bike party, there's a whole bunch of different colored lights. Makes you more visible, sure, but you know, at least the minimum is a white front and a red back. And then if you wanna have some other colorations, like the illuminations tour that Ron's gonna lead, um, full on get your Christmas lights out and make it as colorful as you want. But um, I would say those are priority twos if you're gonna have uh, bright lights. Right, so Ron's question was, would a green tail light be better than a red one? No, 
No, because drivers uh, see red and they expect another vehicle. Um, drivers see green and they might think it's like green, like a street light or a stoplight. Um, and you don't want drivers thinking it's a traffic light that's green. Um, you want them to see you and think of you as a vehicle on the roads. So red is absolutely key. Um, the law requires a red reflector, but in the wintertime, you want to go definitely at least uh, one rear light that's red um, and having some reflectivity as well. And then another comment is that there are lights that you can put around the circumference of your tires that flash mm -hmm. and they're inexpensive and fun. Um, cool. Um, and just a few more slides and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Um, considerations about riding in the winter. So these are tricky because it all changes depending on the snow situation, depending on the route that you choose and depending on how long we've been in winter. So I think we learned a lesson pretty quickly this year when you get a foot and a half of snow, what gets plowed first, what gets plowed second, and what doesn't get plowed at all. So you might be used to riding on the pathways, um, but if the Department of Conservation and Recreation doesn't plow them, you can't necessarily ride in a foot and a half of snow, unless you have a really awesome fat bike, which great, never mind, you're doing great. But for most of us, we stick to the roads. So the concept of you're gonna probably need to change your route depending on what gets cleared. So usually in these presentations, I like to have people think about sticking to side streets, to the quieter roads, to the roads that don't have trucks, don't have buses. Um, and I'd still recommend that for just avoiding traffic. However, you have to keep in mind that those might be a second priority for snow clearance. So for instance, um, I use Central Square as a great example. Usually when I'm riding through Central Square, um, and it'll change because the cycle tracks are being built and Cambridge is wonderful. You're gonna have separated pathways eventually. But these days I say Green Street is a great um, alternative or Bishop Allen is a great alternative to riding on Mass Ave. But if it's not cleared, you're gonna to need to stick to the major roads. So that's a consideration to have. Bike lanes that are typically on the right-hand side of roads kind of go away in the winter time um, because that's where the snow gets pushed onto. So you're gonna to need to be comfortable riding in traffic. I've found, now I fully admit I'm an able-bodied person and am confident out there, but I've found that drivers typically are more tolerant in the wintertime when the bike lane is plowed in and are uh, more patient driving behind me when I'm biking in the middle of the lane. As long as I'm visible, as long as I'm predictable, as long as I'm doing all of my basic hand signals that I can when I'm comfortable to do so, um, I, I find the drivers are accommodating and everybody slows down a little bit in the winter as well. But I wanna make sure that you are as comfortable on the routes that you have. So be, um, be creative on the routing that you, uh, you, you choose. And it may mean taking uh, an extra few blocks to get around um, a route that you would otherwise normally take. Or, you know, going a little bit more cautiously riding on Mass Ave to make sure that you are riding in the lane and being as prominently placed as possible. Riding in the lane is something you are totally allowed to do within your purview. Um, you are legally allowed to do it. However, all traffic is a negotiation and you gotta make sure that you are negotiating with all the drivers out there and doing so in a safe manner. So um, if that's something to consider, just keep in mind, um, Cambridge is a great resource. The CDD is a great resource to let you know about which roads um, are under construction, which roads will have bike infrastructure, which roads are being plowed. And um, it is changing literally almost every single day because of the way that the plowing is taking place and the way that construction is taking place out there in Cambridge. Cool. Um, couple things about technique. We talked about this a little bit, so I'll breeze through this slide. Um, you're gonna wanna take it slower. Um, you're gonna wanna not make sudden maneuvers. Um, if you are used to riding in dry conditions, you're probably used to leaning in order to make your turns. In the winter, you're gonna wanna steer to make your turns. You're gonna wanna take more of a slower turn. And if you're ever riding on ice, you're gonna need to just keep riding straight. Um, if you find that you're losing traction, if you hit a break or make a sudden um, turn, you run the risk of slipping out. Now, if we were in person, and I wish I could see you all, I usually ask, 
How many of you in your winters of New England have ever slipped when you're walking out there? I guarantee you, you're gonna raise your hand. How many of you, if you are a driver, have ever had your car slide a little bit when you're driving out there? I guarantee you're gonna raise your hand. You might need to expect the same when you're biking. So if you're not comfortable with a little bit of losing traction, and for those of you who are mountain bikers or cyclocross racers, you're like primed for this, um, you're gonna to wanna to lower your seat a little bit. Um, you might be used to a higher seat for efficiency, but if you need to catch yourself if you're slipping, lower your seat a couple of inches. Might make you a little slower, might make you a little less efficient, but you might have a better uh, job of, of catching your traction. Um, be extra mindful if there is construction, if there's a sewer grate or a steel plate or any metal in the roads, it is slicker than oil. So keep in mind that if you're riding through Cambridge and there's construction out there, you have to be extra, extra cautious when you're riding in the snow and ice. Um, and we talked about this before, um, lowering the tire pressure, changing your route, being prepared to ride with traffic, not next to traffic. Um, I also have a great adage from one of my mentors, Jessica Mink, and she says that you're gonna need to change your technique when you're riding in the snow. And technique is as important as equipment. So if it's new to you, just like I mentioned, if you change your equipment, get familiar with it. Get familiar with riding in the snow and ice in a safe environment. So ride in a parking lot, find a parking lot that's empty and go kind of bike sledding. Get comfortable slipping a little bit so that not to the point where you fall, but if you lose a little bit of traction in the rear wheel, what does that feel like? If you slide a little bit unexpectedly, what does that feel like? Do it in a safe environment. Now, again, if this is not of interest to you, if you don't wanna do this, don't worry. You can, you can always take the T or walk or find other roads to get there. But for those of you who are interested in riding in the snow and ice, you're gonna need to think about and practice your technique when you're out there. So change your technique and get familiar with how it's changed. Cool. Any, any questions so far, Jen? I'll take a quick pause. Great. Um, just a few more and I'll wrap up. Um, locking, this is extra important if you're in the city. Um, your bike racks might get plowed in. The Cambridge Community Development Department is gonna be out as much as possible shoveling out and the DPW is gonna be out as much as possible shoveling out those bike racks. But we all know that bike racks are in between um, typically the walking area on the sidewalk and the driving area on the roads and they get plowed in. So uh, be mindful. And you might have to lock up a block or two from your destination. Um, if you are gonna be a long-term parker, ideally find indoor parking the best as possible. Hopefully your employer, if you're riding to work or your apartment building, if you have an apartment building, somewhere you might have to get creative to find covered parking. Um, if you are parking outside, be mindful that it's not gonna be during a snow event. You wanna make sure that you don't get plowed in. If you leave your bike outside and it snows a foot, don't be surprised if you come out and the snow plows have put three feet of snow on top of it. If you can bring your bike in during the snow event, your bike will be that much happier. Um, and then typical standard locking suggestions are the same. Make sure you lock the frame, not just the wheels, Make sure you're locking to a bike rack, not a handicap access sign, not a fire exit, not something that's gonna block the right of way. And know that bike parking definitely decreases in the winter time. It's just a fact of life out there. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, we used to have a campaign where Mass Bike would go out and shovel out bike racks. Um, it's not really that feasible, um, but we're trying to. Maybe we can get the Cambridge bike safety folks to get out there to shovel out bike racks as a campaign. Uh, or something along those lines, maybe they can get an Amazon gift card or something. But that said, um, you're gonna wanna make sure that you have a safe spot free from the plows as much as possible. Cool. Um, we just mentioned a lot of the stuff, I'm not gonna belabor this point, but Cambridge is doing a really good job of clearing the bike pathways and the cycle tracks, we call them, that are separated bikeways. So though I just mentioned a lot of the challenges about riding, you're gonna find a lot of successes about riding too. And um, sometimes the bike lanes are plowed even better than the roadways sometimes. 
um, and usually even better than the sidewalks. So it might even be easier to bike there than it might be to drive there or walk there. But um, just be patient, give yourself extra time. Um, don't expect miracles, we're all people. Um, thank your DPW, thank your city employees. They're doing a darn good job and it is an impossible job for them to do. Um, and there's a lot of users. There's T riders, there's bus riders, there's handicapped folks, there's folks in strollers, um, there's drivers, there's on-street parking, there's bikers, there's just all sorts of users that are sharing the same road and same space out there. So um, have a lot of patience. Um, and the C, was it C-Click Fix? Is that the, the app? Um, yeah, it's called Commonwealth has, Connect. Commonwealth Connect, thank you. Um, is a great resource too to let the city of Cambridge know when something needs to be cleared out. Um, they're there to help you out. They're not there to be an adversary, but keep in mind limited resources and they are people. So they're doing the best they can. And the Cambridge um, city is, is really, is out there 24 seven helping out this stuff. So um, have some patience and just make sure that uh, you are, you know, just being kind because it's, it's hard um, on everybody out there. Um, and there's just, there's a couple questions on this, Galen. Mm -hmm. One is about what happens if your bike does get snowed on and you can get it out relatively soonish, what can you do? And, and Ron mentions, you know, the chain rusting. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, great. So I was going to wrap up with the side. So the, the maintenance is actually the best. I might just flip to the winter maintenance slide. Um, this is, this is the last thing I'll, I'll jump onto here is you're gonna need to make sure that the snow and salt is off your bike as best as possible because if you let it sit on your steel parts, it's going to cause rust. Um, if you were gonna ride in all seasons, and again, only if you choose to, be okay getting a new chain in the spring. It's not the end of the world. It's a relatively low cost, um, but the salt and sand that you will be riding through um, will eat through the components that get destroyed mainly the chain because it's such fine pieces of machinery and such fine metal. Um, be extra mindful about clearing um, the snow from your bike, especially if you're gonna bring it inside. Um, I usually take a broom, I have it out on my front porch. So I will like brush off my bike the best as possible. Snow will collect around the chain, snow will collect around the gears, what's called the bottom bracket where the pedals and the cranks lock into the bike, brush that off clean that off before you bring it inside because you don't want that to turn to water and the salt and sand that you've ridden through to seep into the bike. You wanna brush it off while it's still snow. Um, that'll save you a lot of trouble. Um, get some bike specific cleaner. So we have an example here, Green Fizz, which is great. Um, maybe, you know, if you're gonna ride every day, if you're gonna be that hardcore, um, think about maybe a once a week clean or a little bit just, you know, a little more due diligence than you would if you were riding in the good season. Um, this is why I actually have a beater bike, like a, a kind of a cheaper mountain bike that I ride in the winter um, so that I can destroy it. And it's a little bit cheaper to replace some componentry, but I know that's not for everybody. Your bike is probably totally fine for riding in, but um, do the due diligence. I think I'll leave it at uh, wipe down the salt and sand, use a cleaner every so often just to get in there with a rag, um, if you ever see some snow and salt, it's fine. Bikes are meant to get wet. They're outdoor creatures. It's fine. They're allowed to be outside. Um, but if you let them sit with, with salt, it's gonna bring on rust. So you're gonna wanna clean your chain with lubricant, not just with degreaser. So cleaning the chain with a degreaser is great to get the sand and salt off, but you're gonna wanna put a bike specific lubricant on your chain fairly regularly, maybe once a week, to make sure that it stays uh, squeak free and can still rotate and shift and do all the stuff that a chain needs to do. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the ABCs of bike maintenance, we have a whole presentation on the CDD's YouTube, um, which we filmed. It kind of runs through pumping up the tires, checking the brakes, using the barrel adjusters, cleaning the chain. Um, it's a really easy process to clean the chain. Um, I could. I could talk about it for an hour, but I'm not going to. Um, it's a four-step process though. You wipe down the chain, get the initial debris off. Then you put the lubricant on the chain. And again, it's gotta be bike specific. So WD-40, only if it's bike WD-40. WD-40 is not a lubricant, it's a solvent. You wanna get something that's a lubricant 
So you grease the chain, it's the second step. Third step is you kind of let it sit. You work the chain a little bit. You kind of run it backwards. You let it sit for maybe 15 minutes to get through the chain. And then the last step, the fourth step is to wipe it down again. Um, the chain that we have shown here at the top, it's really greasy um, and it's really rusty. So avoid it looking like that. It's gonna be hard in the winter, um, but again, wipe it down, lube it up, wait, let it sit and settle through the chain. And the last step is arguably the most important step is to wipe it down again, which is the step that a lot of people skip. And if your chain is really greasy, it's actually gonna attract a lot of the salt and sand you're riding in. So it's, it's actually almost more detrimental. And so again, that four step process for cleaning the chain. And then lastly, typically, like I mentioned, you wipe down the, the bike, um, you know, at least every day to get the salt and slush off. If you're gonna ride in salt and slush, um, but definitely wipe down where the brakes are. So where the brake pads hit the rim, where the brake, whatever type of brakes you have, you're gonna wanna make sure that they're generally free of debris the best you can. So do an extra due diligence of kind of cleaning off the brakes, making sure that the brake pads are clean. Um, and if you wanna go the extra step, uh, the, the extra mile is you get some rubbing alcohol and you can wipe down the rims of your bike and that gets rid of the, the, the grease and the oil and cleans them off. And you can even wipe down the brake pads with a, a rag with rubbing alcohol, but only, only rubbing alcohol for your rims and your brakes because those evaporate and they don't leave any residue. So, you know, there's a lot that we could talk about with maintenance, but the be all end all is do it regularly in the winter time, way more than you would in the good season. Don't let the salt and sand turn to water to soak into the bike, so clean it off. Clean your chain with the four-step process, and then check where the brakes are pretty regularly with a rag. And sometimes I'll ride with a rag if I'm going to ride in the snow, because um, if it, it becomes harder to brake because it gets all gunked up, I'll just stop and kind of wipe down my brakes, and then I, you know, back to normal. And that's probably one of the most important things to keep in mind. Yeah. There's two more questions. One has to do with brakes, so I'm going to go to this one, and then we'll go back to the other. Mm -hmm. um, what is how, what about maintenance in the winter time? if you've got disc brakes instead of rim brakes? Ooh, great question. So the same things of just having the rag available and the same thing about rubbing alcohol. Only use rubbing alcohol on disc brakes. If you get it uh, greasy, it's contaminated and you're gonna need to replace your pads. And that's a big old pain. You're not gonna be able to stop. Now disc brakes are great because they're more enclosed. So they're less likely to collect debris, but they will still collect debris. So I do the same, just the same as I would wiping down a rim with a rag and rubbing alcohol, you wanna wipe down the rotor of the disc brake, which is in the center of the wheel. Um, you're gonna to wanna to wipe down the rotor with rubbing alcohol and a rag, just like you would a rim. Awesome, thank you. And then the second question has to do with um, bike parking. And um, one person has had their bike stolen multiple times, I'm so sorry. And they're wondering if you can suggest the best best bike ring to choose when you're on street to park to? Ooh, um, good question. Um, is it the question about the bike or is the question about the rack or is the question about the lock? The rack itself, but I think probably the lock is, pro is the answer, I would think. Yeah, so let me grab my quick steel lock. Sorry. So this is kind of my go-to. It's small, so I'll usually have a secondary lock that's a cable lock, but this is really, Solid. It's a kryptonite U-lock. I've had this one for about 10 years. It's still doing great. Um, you can't cut this unless you have like a giant angle grinder and cause lots of sparks. And it's like really not easy to cut. Um, if you have a cable lock, a thief with a bolt cutter can come and just clip the cable lock and walk away with your bike. So that's the first step. Um, sometimes I'll use the small lock for my frame and then a cable lock for the wheels. Um, so that if a thief is really going for it, they might steal a wheel. And I have in my 20 years here lost two wheels, which is heartbreaking, I know. Um, but, you know, at least the frames are there. Um, and it's not that common. Um, but the rack itself, oh, so this, the steel lock for the frame, let me go back to the locking up slide. Um, steel lock for the frame, as you can see in the top one. Um, and then if you want to do a secondary cable, you can almost see a secondary cable in that graphic as well. Um, and the rack itself, make sure it's a bike rack for one. If you lock to a pole, some poles are dummy poles and thieves know which poles are not cemented into the ground and they'll come and just 
pull the pole up and walk away with your bike. Um, try to find a bike rack itself. Um, and you know, you might want to give the bike rack a shake. Cambridge is really good, but other municipalities, you know, are a little trickier where the bike racks are not necessarily that well installed, or if it's a private developer, they might not really know what they're doing because they're focused on like a multi-million dollar development and the bike parking is very, you know, bottom of their list. So give the bike rack a solid shake to make sure it's like actually in the ground. Um, but try to find one that's like ideally sited and placed by the city of Cambridge, because you know that one, it's not blocking a right of way. So that's the guarantee that the bike rack itself is there. So that doesn't block handicap access or anything else. Um, and two, that it's actually affixed very firmly in the ground. Um, but it's, unfortunately bike theft is, um, it's, not a, it's not a common trait, but it is a fact out there uh, every so often. And it is heartbreaking every single time. So I feel for you. Um, I have only lost one bike, knock on wood, um, in my careers, but it's um, it's the worst feeling in the world because you know your bike is not just your vehicle; it's almost like your emotional attachment to wonderment, and uh, it's your healthy transportation, it's your freedom, it's your independence, it's your riding with friends, and then to have that be taken away from you, it's it's really tragic. But if you do get it stolen, um, report it, um, contact the Cambridge Police or whatever ju jurisdiction you're at. Um, if you have the ability to find the serial number, report the serial number, because sometimes they are recovered. Um, if you haven't registered your bike yet, uh, register it with the Cambridge Police Department, or if you're a Harvard student with the Harvard Police Department or the MIT Police Department or whatever police department you're, you're with, register your bike. Um, go to their webpage, it'll tell you how to register it. Um, and every so often we do recover bikes. So there's a story out right now, Boston Police and Alston and Brighton have recovered about 45 bikes just this past week. Um, they, they broke up a sting. So now they have 45 bikes they're sitting on and they wanna be able to return them to their owners. But if the owner hasn't registered the bike, it's a lot harder to do that. So number one rule about not uh, losing your bike is register your bikes first. If you bought it from a bike shop, that bike shop will have a record of the serial number and proof that it's yours. But if you bought it secondhand or off Craigslist or something, um, as long as you can claim it and register it, um, then it's yours. And then if it's ever recovered, you can get it back. And also another good point, often people leave their bikes attached to city parking during the winter. They'll just leave it for the whole winter. They forget about it or whatever. After a certain number of weeks, the police or Department of Public Works will come and cut them off, assuming that they're abandoned. So I've heard from lots of folks who have lost their bikes that way. It, they're honestly really short staffed. So they've got to be out there for months before they take them. So don't forget your bike on public parking for the whole winter. One, it'll be ruined. Um, but two, it'll get it'll get cut at the end yeah. of that winter. Yeah. And if it is cut, you might be able to get it back if you've registered it. So DPW does hold on to bikes for like three months or longer sometimes. So um, even if they do remove it, because technically, I think I don't know what the city ordinance is. I think it's 72 hours but that's that's never held no. usually it's multiple weeks yeah it's um, usually multiple and honestly multiple months yeah yeah but yes we don't get rid of them we keep them at the dpw yard for a long time so if you ever that does happen to you and you've you've got a serial number that we can get it that we can look and verify it you're set cool um thank you jen i really appreciate the the extra added tips and because i think we added all the questions during the presentation we went a little longer than an hour but we we're still within our 90 minutes um, but I'm happy to stick around and answer any more questions that are popping up. Um, and if folks want to share uh, in the next five minutes or so some of their winter gear, um, feel free to unmute. I don't know if we want to stop the recording or however, but I'll leave this slide up. Um, A.D. Filson is typically the runner of these. She's the education and mobility coordinator, but she's on vacation already. So this is why I'm stepping in at Mass Bike, but we partner all the time with A.D. So, um, we're proud to be here with you, Jen, at the CDD. And, um, but again, here's the tips, layer up, cover up, you know, make sure you've got the right gear, the right equipment, tread lightly, tread slowly, be bright. And, um, you know, I should also add in here, be patient and be kind when you're riding out there. But um, we've got a lot of folks here, 50, 52 folks here, which is super impressive. So um, I'm happy to stick around and um, yeah, thank you so much, Jen.